they got somebody else to come in here and do this. Um, I'm going to start by reading you a poem by um, Walter Brueggemann. Is, do, anybody here what, read Walter Brueggemann? I think I, I mentioned him last week. The brilliant, brilliant Old Testament scholar, but uh, an amazing poet. And he's the first person that I know of that um, really took lament seriously. So this is one of his poems. So, um, And it's a prayer. No wonder the prophet weeps yet. We begin again, but not innocent. As we begin, the powers of globalization surge. There are victims, but we're mostly beneficiaries. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are victims, but we're the likely perpetrators. There's violence among women and toward the poor, violence that refuses to forgive, and we are a mix of victim and perpetrator. The democratic process continues, but it's mostly void of gra devoid of gravitas, and our alarm is modest. No wonder there's fear, reams of despair, and acres of weeping, and we feebly watch and wait for you. Teach us how to weep while we wait, and how to hope while we weep, and how to care while we hope. Teach us through this strange, ancient, immediate text. Amen. It was a, he opens all of his classes with a prayer like that. And they were collected in uh, one book called Odd to Heaven, uh, Rooted to Earth, The Prayers of Walter Brueggemann. So uh, I highly recommend, um, highly recommend that to you. So we are going to look at lament. Um, I'll tell you how I got into this. Uh, here's another obscure, I like all these relatively obscure writers. Anybody heard of Calvin Sierveld? Okay, write that down. He's great. He wrote a book called Rainbows for a Fallen World. Uh, he's an uh, aesthetics professor at the University of Toronto. He's about 80 years old. And uh, I read that book. It, it's a book on creativity and got so excited about him. I wrote him letters, you know, and just, you know, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, that kind of thing. And after 9-11, I don't have it anymore. I kept it for a long time. After 9-11, we got to be friends. After 9-11, I get a postcard from Toronto, from Calvin Sierveld, and it has one line on it. It said, see, you have no songs to sing. That was his way of saying, you need to get serious about lament. You know, and, and we didn't have any songs to sing. You know, we played... Amazing Grace on the Bagpipes or something like that. But, uh, and that very same year, um, my sister uh, lost two children. Uh, one was born, um, it was actually in 13 months. Uh, one was born with every birth defect a baby can have. Uh, open spine, hydrocephalic, blind, you know, and he, it was a little boy. He, he lived two months and died. And when he died, we kind of, you know, the Lord's in that. He's, he would have had a miserable life and maybe, you know. Um, 13 months later, she has another little boy and he's perfect. And at two months, he died of a ruptured appendix. And so in the wake of 9-11 and Calvin's uh, postcard, then uh, <laughs> that happened. And, and again, I didn't know how to lament. I didn't know what to do. I mean, the first baby, I could handle that and we could be, find some sad psalms to read together and that sort of thing. But when the second one happened, that was, you know, I had, had nothing. Uh, and then at the end of that year, my best friend and my, uh, uh, my mother died on the same day and they had their funerals on the same day. And uh, my best friend, was, uh, his name was Denny Denson. Denny had been a Black Panther in Chicago in the 60s. And right before he died, I went to see him uh, in Franklin. He had pancreatic cancer. And I said, uh, oh, Denny, if, if only I could take this away, if only I could take this on myself, brother, I would do it. And he looked up at me and said, you couldn't handle this. <laughs> so, so there was this sort of history that got me in, into this realization that we really didn't have any songs to sing. And, uh, and so that's how... We, I find myself, we find ourselves here today. So here, here are a few um, 
few ideas, and uh, and I'm going to I'm going to read a read a few other things uh, before we get into the uh, actually looking at at uh, presuppositions and things like that. So just think about this: What's the first sound you make to show that you're alive? You weep. You weep, right? What's the first sound you hear when you're born? Probably weeping. Your mother, you know, <laughs> unless there's a good pain control guy there. Or, uh, you know, that it's almost the first sound you hear. Uh, what's the first lesson you learn? The first thing you learn is, if I cry long enough, somebody will come. Right? If I lay here in the bed and cry long enough, a face is going to appear over the crib and I'm going to... Somebody's going to take care of me. So those, those first lessons all involve uh, weeping. Um, um, yeah, I'm looking at mine. Yeah. Uh, so let me read a little essay that has to do with that. All of our journeys, yours and mine, began with lament, did they not? Before we uttered our first breathless cries, our mothers lamented in pain, giving birth to us just as God said would be one of the consequences of Adam and Eve's first doubting, Genesis 3.16. We were all ushered into a world in which the first sounds we heard were inevitably weeping, weeping from pain, weeping from joy, because the two are often linked more closely than you can imagine. Tears of joy and tears of sorrow can be very close. After a brief moment of flailing arms and legs, we were wiped clean and swaddled. We experienced Strangely familiar shadows of presence in the warmth of, our, warmth of our mother's embrace. And deep inside our infant intuitions, we felt the comforting reality of her hesed. Uh, the other thing that Lament did for me, it introduced me to the concept of hesed. And there, we'll start out tonight with two primary ideas, the idea of, that were in that last sentence. The idea of presence and the idea of hesed. Now, we all know what hesed, I don't have to explain that to you because we looked at that for a long time. Uh, our first experiences are of presence. We're held by, uh, and we sense this love that won't let us go. And we experience the, 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 the hesed, this unique, deep, uh, indefinable love uh, of our mothers. Um, and, I mean, the word hesed uh, comes from, um, no, rakam comes from womb, sorry. Forget what, forget what I was going to say. We, st we sensed in her someone who would never leave us or forsake us. We felt radiating from her heart a love that would never let us go. But these experiences was, would always be fleeting, fragmented, incomplete, interrupted, and so ultimately unsatisfying. Neither her presence nor that of anyone else could ever replace the presence, capital P, and Hesed we were created to know and inhabit and that inhabits and knows each of us. The rest of our lives would be spent trying to satisfy our deep hunger for them both. We often lean too hard on friends to provide them for us. We inevitably drain our spouses dry in a vain attempt to fill that eternally empty reservoir in our souls that only his presence will ever fill. We were created to live with him in a garden, and yet we wake up every morning in a deserted uh, desert in the deserted desert of a fallen world. So each of our lives are pulled along by these needs, by this grim gravitational pull of the fall along the sovereign path of lament. <laughs> Not of the room. I'm really bringing the room down. I'm sorry. Um, um, let me re read just a couple more things. It's just easier to read it than try to. Uh, this is called a harmful silence. And one of the ideas, ancillary ideas of lament is the idea that uh, we are told constantly that it's wrong to lament, right? The, the impression is it's, it's wrong. Uh, that's what Job's friends were telling him. You shouldn't be lamenting, right? Okay. Uh, as we begin to try to understand the shape of the world into which we were born, we would all soon experience the shushing of parents Friends, and whenever we, would, whenever we would inevitably erupt into the wailing of our first infant laments, contained somewhere in the heart of these demands to be quiet, beneath a sincere attempt at comforting, lay a level of shame in the inescapable message that we should not cry, we should not behave in such ways, that wanting the comfort of presence 
and the assurance of Hesed were really somehow selfish or sinful. At that frustrating moment, we entered into the very, very fallen human aspect of denial, which is the polar opposite of lament. The opposite of lament is denial. As a result, we grew up trying to control our tears and trying to help others control theirs, thinking in the midst of it all somehow that we might even be able to control the pain. All our ulcers and neuroses unfold as an inescapable consequence. That single pathway through it all, the path of lament, became overgrown, lost, and left off all of our maps. The bottom line, we're all born into a world we were not really made to inhabit. We were created for God, made to flourish in the comfort of his presence, with the, in the warm context of his undeniable hesed. Now in this fallen world, we're cut off from them both. Uh, only the loving sovereignty of all wise God could redeem such a hopeless situation. His solution, to use suffering to save us, to redeem our own suffering, and most significantly, to redeem all mankind through his suffering. God uses suffering to save the world. That's the good news of, of, of lament. Uh, in order to turn around and move once more in the direction of God, we must find this path he's carved out. We must call out to him in the language he's provided. We must regain the tearful trail. We must relearn lament. Now there's two or three more pages and I'm not going to read them. You're welcome. Okay, so that's kind of a brief introduction of uh, biblical lament. Uh, most Numerically, most of the Psalms are, are, are laments. Uh, depending on which scholar you read, the most conservative estimate is a third. Some scholars say half of the Psalms are uh, are, are a lament, and everyone else laments, and we'll, we'll look at all of them. David laments, certainly the prophets lament. And the point of all this for me, you know me well enough, I'm not interested in anything that doesn't lead me to Jesus. <laughs> and lament really leads us to a better understanding of Jesus and his, his life, because Jesus laments. Uh, it's very much a part of his, his uh, life. Okay. Um, some of these things I don't think I need to tell you. I like to start, when we start classes like this, I like to tell you what my presuppositions are, but you already know that. The authority of Scripture is my presupposition. Um, the perfection of the Word of God. Now, we can argue about the nature of the perfection, but I, I still believe the Bible's perfect. Um, I believe in, the, in the Christ, being Christ-centered, that all things hold together in Him, and anything that really ultimately has meaning uh, is uh, leads us back to him or is found in his life. Bonhoeffer's book, Christ the Center, was a very big book. If you haven't read Christ the Center by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you've got to read that book. It's a great, great book. Um, as we look at lament, um, I want to say uh, it's not as much about being right as about being faithful. Uh, and we're, you're going to hear ideas that you're going to think, well, that can't be right. Uh, to, to express my anger to God, well, that can't be right. It's not so much about being right, it's about being faithful. And sometimes the, the only faithful thing to do, and Job does this, and, and some of the Psalms do this as well, uh, we're going to see that sometimes, it might, might not feel right, but sometimes the only thing we can do with our anger is offer it up to God as an act of worship. And we'll see that. That's a very important uh, in lament. Uh, another presupposition is that the Bible is taking us somewhere. I don't have the board up here, but I don't need it because I've drawn this map for you, right? So let me, just in our imaginations, here's, here's the line. And on this end of the line is Job 1 and uh, Genesis 1 and uh, basically uh, Psalm 1. Uh, and we have the equation. The equation is the Torah. If I'm obedient, God will bless me. If I'm disobedient, God will discipline me. Right? And that's a good thing. That's perfect. But the idea is that the Bible's taking us somewhere. And what inevitably happens, Job is the best example. Job realizes that, that the equation is incomplete. The equation, once again, is if I'm obedient, God will bless me. If I'm disobedient, he'll discipline me. What happens to Job? He's obedient, but he thinks he's being punished. So for some, some reason, the equation is not 
working. I don't know how, what language to put it in. My conclusion is the, 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 that equation is incomplete. There's more to the way God relates us to us in the world than if we're good, he blesses. If we're bad, he punishes us. And I, I understand this through my relationship with my children. I have four children. My oldest is uh, Katie. And uh, when Katie um, was little, I would tell her, if, you, if you're obedient, if you clean your room, I'll give you an M&M. If you're disobedient, I'll spank you. That's Torah, right? If you're obedient, you get blessed. If you're disobedient, you get disciplined, okay? Uh, Katie is in her 30s now. I don't relate to her that way anymore, right? Because like the Bible is taking us somewhere in our relationship with God, my relationship with Katie over 30 some odd years has grown and she realizes that I'm not just the M&M man. There's more to our relationship to that. And what a lot of people need to realize is that God is not just the M&M man. In some people's lives, he's just the person that gives you good stuff if you're good and punishes you if you're, if you're bad. And I hear almost every page of the, of the Hebrew Bible, I hear God saying, how can you think that's all I am? He, the, the Bible is taking us somewhere. And uh, the, 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 the best example, again, is, is Job. Job begins very much a man of the equation. And by the end of the book of Job, he and uh, God is basically there. God shows up, presence. God shows up. And he says, I have no one like, you know, Job. And he commands Job's friends to ask Job to pray to God for them. It's a wonderful moment. We'll look at it. But uh, so anyway, that's, that's the idea. A um, couple more ideas. Um, this is number five. This is not just good psychology. You're tempted to think, well, it's good psychology. You get it off your chest. You process your anger and your sorrow and you do something with it. This is more about worshiping God well than it is good psychology. It's not about us. It's about worshiping God well. And again, one of the really stunning ideas for me about lament is, and you see this so much with David and David's laments, he's taking his frustration, he's taking the hatred that he has for his enemies, and he sings about it. He offers it up to God. I, I want you to take this, right? And it becomes an act of worship. So it's, it's about worshiping God well. It's not, I think it is good psychology, by the way, but I don't think that's what it's uh, all about. Um, and then my last point, introductory point is, um, and I got this from a guy that I, uh, I went to who was a counselor for about six years. He said, uh, we all carry around inside ourselves a vast reservoir of suffering and confusion and pain. You may not know it's there. The, the way I realized it, we were, um, we were in the middle of a counseling session. And what was it that he said to me? We were just talking, you know, just like this. No, no emotions, you know, no tears. And he said one thing to me. I forget what it was he said. It was so many years ago. But I ended up, and you know me, this is not me. I ended up on my hands and knees wailing. And it went on, and good counselors aren't supposed to do this, but he finally said, that's enough. <laughs> okay, you're not supposed to do that, right? And what I learned that day was, wow, I had this hurt in me that you camouflage, or you stuff it down, or you do something with it. But that was another thing that made me excited about, I, now I know what to do with that. With that, this reservoir, this, this fingerprint that the fall has left on me, I offer it up to the Lord as an act of worship. It's, it's a very uh, exciting idea. And I, I suggest if you read the Psalms, this is self-evident truth. I don't have to argue, you know, this point. It's a self-evident truth. Um, okay. So three more concluding introductory points. Number one of the conclusion is this is not going to be fun. Life of Jesus, fun. Hesed, that's fun. This is not going to be fun. Uh, our last time together, I'm going to ask you to write a lament, write your own lament. So, and trust me, that won't be fun. Uh, secondly, this is like learning uh, a new language. Um, 
This is really, um, yeah, lost language of lament. This is very much like learning a lost, uh, a, a new language. I've been working on Hebrew for years and years. I'm, ne- I'm always learning Hebrew. I'm never going to learn Hebrew, but I'm learning it. And um, one of the things that's interesting, we go, I go to Israel a lot, and I can say, I can ask, how are you? Ni hao ma. I mean, that's Chinese, sorry. Ni hao ma is Chinese. But that, it works in Chinese, too. Uh, I can go to China. I used to smuggle Bibles into China. So I could say, ni hao ma, right? How are you? But when you told me how you were, I couldn't understand. I didn't know enough Chinese to understand your answer. Uh, what is Hebrew for? Um, Mashlum cha. Or uh, there's a shorter way to say it. I don't, that's not how I say it. Um, the, but our bus driver taught me. It's a colloquial kind of. Manish Ma. Yeah, Manish Ma. Anyway. Um, okay, one more introductory point, and then I'll be ready to start. Uh, sometimes, uh, we, yeah, sometimes we can't understand the question. Uh, we can understand the question, uh, but not the answer. Yeah, Manish Ma. That's, I, I, I just got to my notes. Okay, so it all boils down to this. Uh, question one. Is God a God who is moved by our tears? Is God moved by our tears? Job gives us the answer and answers. Yes, obviously. The the meaning of the book of Job is found in the movement of God. Where's God in chapter 1? He's in heaven. Where's God in chapter 42? He's with Job. There's a wonderful article by a guy named Mattathias Savat called The Meaning of the Book of Job. Um, and it, and basically the meaning of the book of Job is the movement of God. Beautiful, beautiful way of looking at at the book. So, um, second, uh, sometimes the most precious thing we have to offer God is the thing that hurts us the most. Sometimes, sometimes your most precious thing to offer God is that thing that you've been holding on to for so long that hurts you the most. And then finally, uh, the Bible is, I've already said this, the Bible is taking us somewhere. Uh, this is not about defending a position or maintaining. Um, we're going somewhere. We're on a journey. And it's not about being safe. Okay. Okay. Do you, you, is this freaking you out or is this, are you okay with this? Are these new ideas or... Are you like, yeah, I've heard all this before. Okay. Um, yeah, here's the place where I, I, I draw that map about a Torah obedience going to intimacy, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I, what, I, what I will do is demonstrate how that movement works by looking at Psalm, Psalm 73 in this fine, fine translation to CSB. A lot of the Psalms do this. 73 is one of the best uh, illustrations. So let, let me uh, show you how this works. And I'll, I'll read it to you. Psalm 73. This is Asaph. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. What is that? That's the equation. If you're pure in heart, God will be good to you. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I saw that the bad guys were getting blessed, and it ticked me off, because that's not how it's supposed to work. Okay? And uh, he sort of goes off here, but let's let's, let's just follow Asaph. They have an easy time until they die. Their bodies are well fed. Talking about the wicked. Uh, They're not in trouble like others. They're not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace and violence covers them like a garnet. Their eyes bulge from fatness. Now, that's a good thing. In the Semitic word, being fat means you're blessed because there aren't fat. Jesus doesn't know. I guarantee you, Jesus doesn't know any fat people, right? In this world, that's just, you know, sort of, you're never really full. Your stomach is never really full. Every now and then you have a feast, 
and it's a big, it's a big, big deal. Every meal we have is a feast, right? We eat until it hurts every meal. Jesus doesn't, that's not how Jesus lives. That's, that's not how they live. So their eyes bulge from fatness. Their imagination, the imaginations of their heart run wild. They mock, they speak maliciously, they arrogantly threaten oppression. See, he's going, he's really going off. They set their mouths against heaven. Their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the most high know everything? So he's mocking God. Look at them, the wicked. They're always at ease and they increase in their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? This is a lament. See, what, see what's happening? The, his idea of the way the world should work has been violated because bad people, their eyes are bulging from fatness. And he's a good guy. And listen to what he's had to go through. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless. That's the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is one big, long lament that, you know, once you get a taste for this, you're going to see this everywhere in the scriptures. Um, when I try to understand all this, it seemed uh, hopeless. And here's until I entered God's sanctuary. What is that? Presence. OK, God shows up and things begin to make sense. Until I entered God's sanctuary, then I understood their destiny. Indeed, he's been saying, me, 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 they, 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 they. Listen to the pronoun shift. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by tears, like one waking from a dream. Lord, when arising, you will despise their image. Now here comes the apology. This is Asaph, but David usually does something like this at the end of his Psalms. He'll say things like, you know, I really shouldn't have talked like that. But he needed to talk like that. Job apologizes. Remember, Job says, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth, right? I shouldn't have said these things. But they were things that needed to be said. Uh, Bonhoeffer says that, that God has taken the complaints of men and made them part of his holy word. Okay. So here comes, the, uh, here comes the apology. When I became embittered and my innermost being was wounded, I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal toward you. Yet, and here it comes, presence. I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. See, the, he, he, his eyes were on uh, the, the wicked, then his eyes were on himself, and then now he turns his eyes to God, and everything sort of makes sense, okay? Uh, I love this. Who do I have in heaven but you? My question is, is this the same God that wrote the first 17 verses? Because this does not sound like the same person. What has happened? He has exhausted himself against God. That's what lament does. He's exhausted himself against God. Um, who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on, on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. There it is. Presence and hesed. Those are the two things uh, that, that uh, laments end up being about. I've made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. So there's Psalm 73, which is sort of a uh, pattern, uh, the best illustration of how laments work. Okay, Lament, 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 and then there's a turn. And it's usually uh, the, the, the Hebrew letter vav, which is just a line, is translated but. So it's usually lament, 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 but you, O Lord, and then it becomes... Uh, it becomes praise. It's all worship, right? Even when he's lamenting and complaining, that's worship. Worship recognizes the worth, worth-ship. Worship is based on the worth of God, and God is worth giving your, you know, handing your, uh, your sorrows to. Um, 
we learned that God's, we learned God's worth in the context of, of uh, lamenting in the wilderness. Let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. Uh, what was Jesus doing when he was most being used by God? He was lamenting. That's a big idea. He hangs on the cross and he says, why have you forsaken me? He offers up his suffering and his confusion. And God uses that to save the world. Um, God uses suffering to save the world. Anything you need to say to God, you can, say, you can say to God. Not once in scripture does God ever say to any of his children, how dare you speak to me like that. Now he says that to the Philistines in one passage. I can't remember where it is, but it's in the Hebrew Bible. At one point the Philistines say something, God says, how dare you speak to me that way. But never to his children will God ever say, how dare you speak to me that way. And what that means is you are free to say anything you need to say. And if you don't have the language, the Bible will give you the language. If you don't have the words to cry out or to complain or to show your anger or to show your sorrow, or to show your confusion. The Bible will give you the words. And that's, uh, that's good news. Um, yeah. Okay. This is all preliminary stuff. Okay, so uh, p p uh, laments are about hesed and presence. Um, but hesed and presence are the problem, aren't they? They're the problem. Uh, what, what does Job say about the presence of God? Where are you, right? When I need you to the most, that's when you were the farthest from helping me. Uh, what's the problem with hesed? You know, the God, this God of infinite kindness. Well, what happens when your children die? What happens when you lose two children in 13 months? Does that, that doesn't sound like Hesed to me. There's something wrong with the equation. And uh, at that point, you've got two choices. You can say, I'm out of here, which a lot of people do. Um, or you can say, I'm not going to leave the dance floor till the music's over. Okay. We're, and that's what Job does. You know, his friends say, you should not talk like this. He says, I'm going to keep talking like this until God shows up. And what happens? God shows up. Right? Presence. God shows up. So, um, so th those are, um, yeah, Hesed and presence are what it's about, but they're also uh, the problem. One other thing, um, my note says skip question mark, but for some reason I feel like we should share this. Uh, so there's one other, uh, one other aspect of laments, and it's called uh, the formula of remembrance. And uh, I won't read it, but Psalm 78, verses 4 through 8, um, is followed by 63 verses of remembering. I've got lots of references, Psalm 42, Psalm 68, Psalm 74, Isaiah 49, 15. These are all psalms that are, are, are about remembering. And what happens is the lamentor, the person who's feeling the absence of God, and this um, uh, inconsistency with God's loving kindness, they'll remember what God has done. Mary, when Mary's singing her song in Luke, she remember, it's not a lament, but she's, she remembers the things that God have, has done. So formula of remembrance uh, is, is part. Um, when God seems to be acting in a way that's inconsistent, we remember his past actions and until he shows up again. Um, um, that, that helps. Okay. So here are, here are our, major, our major themes. And I'm, uh, my note says, lament is such a massive subject, it's best to break it up. And that's what I'm going to break it up into some pieces here, into some more pieces. Uh, I already said this, I'm just going to say it again. Uh, first of all, it's wilderness worship. Exodus 7, 16, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. And this is how it works. Worship. Where do you learn the worth of God? In the wilderness, right? When they have no water, strike the rock, living water. They got no food, manna. Uh, manna is one of my favorite Hebrew words. And let, let me, uh, if I had to, 
I should have put the board up, but um, manna is two letters. It's a mem, ma, and it's a nun, na. Ma is a question mark in Hebrew word. Uh, when I see the bus driver in our, in our, our Israeli bus driver, I'll, I'll go, maze. Say, what's this? What's going on? It's kind of a cheeky way. Maze. So ma, ma, na, ma is a question mark. Na is an uh, exclamation point. You, you know this word. Hosea, na. Mara, na, tha. It's an exclamation point. So uh, the word mana, if it's literally translated, is a question mark and exclamation point. Because they pick up this stuff off the ground or it's hanging in the bushes and they go, mana. You know, what is, what is this stuff? You know, and, uh, and that's why it's just transliterated because you can't translate it. It's untranslatable. So, um, I don't know. I think that's interesting. So, and, that, and that's what happens in the wilderness, mana. Um, the purpose of deliverance in the wilderness is always worship. It's always worship. Uh, in Job 120, the, what's the first thing he does after he loses everything? He falls down and worships, right? He, it's an appeal. It's a recognition of the worth of God. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter if you feel like it or not. You know, God uh, deserves, uh, I'm not the right word. Uh, in 2 Samuel 12, 20, when David learns of the death of his child, I love that passage. Um, you, you know the story? This child is sick, and David knows it's his fault, right? And he's writhing on the floor, and he won't eat, and he won't sleep. And he hears his servants out in the hall whispering, and he realizes this child's died. And he goes out in the hall, and he says, has he died? And they say, yes, he's died. He didn't even live long enough to be named. It's this nameless little boy who dies. It's tragic. And after David hears that he's, de he's died, what does he do? He washes his face, eats supper, puts on clothes, and the, his, his uh, servants think he's gone nuts because he's gone from this lamenting, rolling on the floor, to, and what's his, what's his statement? He says, I will go to him, but he's not going to come to me. So he's dead. He's not coming back to me, but I'm going to go to him. And I suggest to you that is the kind of clarity people have who know about lament. David exhausted himself against God. And then once the child was gone, he, uh, he has this disturbing, disturbing clarity. That's 2 Samuel 12, 20. Uh, the equation... Presence, Hesed. Okay, I've looked at all these things. Okay, uh, let me read uh, one more quick, quick essay to you. And and this this opening is is based on. Have already said this is a very uh, elegant idea. No, I don't think I've said this. Have you realized that human teardrops are older than raindrops? There were tears. Before it rained, Adam and Eve wept in the garden. It hadn't rained yet. There was a mist that came up and watered the earth. So teardrops are older and I think in some ways more fundamental than raindrops. They're purposeful. They're meaningful. They're, uh, I mean, Jesus wept. Okay. Uh, before there were drops of rain, human tears fell in the garden, and that was the beginning of lament. God's presence and hesed had always been a given in Eden. But once Adam and Eve were cast out, away from the immediacy of the presence, lament would become their language. In fact, it would become the language of all creation. What does Paul say in Romans 8.20? The whole creation is groaning. The creation is lamenting. Okay? Um, and every lament from Adam's to ours would cry out for Hesed in the wilderness of the fallen world. You and I were created to wake up in a garden. Instead, we open our eyes each morning to a world where God seems disturbingly absent. Because nothing could ever be beyond his perfect intention, it was a sovereign sorrow that fell upon the world, a wordless sorrow beyond our knowing. If God is sovereign, 
then our, he's sovereign in terms of our sorrow as well. And as his loving wisdom does with all things, and especially even with our sin, God would redeem disobedience and sorrow, transforming it by means of his hesed into a pathway back to his presence. That's what lament does for us. We lack the language to articulate this forsaken, fallen struggle. We long for the words to cry out our confusion and bewildered pain. The Bible provides such a language for us, and that's lament. Uh, let me go on. Just No, no, I'll stop there. Okay, that's really all I have for our, our introduction. I mean, because next week we'll get into Job. Uh, and I know I haven't filled up the whole hour, but... I mean, is that enough? Has that been, <laughs> are those enough ideas for you for, you know, for an hour? Any, any uh, responses or is a lot to take in? I've been thinking about this a long time and I'm, I still think about it all, a, a lot. They're, they're, I told you this wasn't going to be easy. But it, a lot of it is undoing. I don't know. If you, I grew up in a church where we were basically, the, 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 uh, the implication was if you're, if you're sad, you leave that at the door. We're going we're gonna to worship. We've come here to worship. And, uh, and I would sit there and, th you know, I don't really have anything to offer up. But when I found out that worship can, part of worship can be offering up our sorrow, I thought, well, I may be the best worshiper he's got. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Isn't he lucky I'm on his team because I've got a lot to offer up. A lot of things I'm confused about. But it, doesn't it speak to the character of God that he invites us into this difficult conversation? I think it's, it's amazing. You're not going to say, how dare you say that to me? Or, you know, you're, you know if you've got a three-year-old that's weeping, you don't whack him and say, you know, grow up. God doesn't do that to us. He, he takes our, well, the psalm says he takes our tears, puts them in a bottle. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's a little bit of a new way to, th way to think. So any Questions, please don't disagree with me. I'm very fragile. You might see me lament or cry if you disagree with me. <laughs> yes, comment. Yeah, it looks like it. Let's just see people can hear you at home. You ought to just throw the mic. That'd be cool. Uh, so, uh, so much of our experience, Christian experience in the Western world, is relatively easy. Easy? Easy. Mm -hmm. Compared to much of the world. Yes, but. Okay, keep talking. But, uh, and, and we, we have trouble. So suffering is somehow related to this lamenting too, it seems to me. Absolutely. And, uh, and we, we have trouble with accepting suffering as is a, is a normal part of, of our that's Christian why the walk. suicide rate is so high. And, uh, yeah, just, yeah, just that, I mean, from living overseas, that's kind of what I, I get is that, you know, suffering is so much a part of, of our walking with God. Mm -hmm. So, yes. so I don't know, just, I'm looking forward to hearing more about. Yeah. Well, and again, the good news is he redeems it. He inhabits it. He uses it. And he encourages us to offer it to him. I'll, I'll share this with you guys. In college, uh, I almost committed suicide twice. Bought a gun to shoot myself. I mean, I was, uh, I was pretty serious about it. And that's another reason why this has so, been so life-changing for me. Because anybody who struggles with depression, um, I mean, this is what we can do with those feelings. You know, God, God, he inhabits those things and, and, and he, he makes it meaningful and redemptive and he uses it. And Jesus, again, we're, all of this is going to Jesus. He is the, the, the incarnation of all of these ideas. Man of sorrows, right? He's a man of sorrows. But is he, is he ineffective? Is he uh, off to the side struggling with depression someplace? No. You know, he, 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 um, he weeps the tears of the world. He enters redemptively into our suffering. And he uses, he offers his suffering to save the world. Now, I don't think our suffering obviously has that same, same redemptive quality, but it can be, our suffering can be redemptive. Um, 
I, I really believe that because of what I, I experienced in college, I am uniquely qualified to talk to someone who's struggling with the same thing. I would just as soon not be qualified that way. Uh, someone who survived cancer or some illness, you know, hor horrible struggle, right? Guess what? You're uniquely qualified to help people to go into people's lives and, and, uh, um, and redeem that suffering. I mean, that's, we, we've got crosses around. We're wearing crosses around our necks. For goodness sake, we should understand that suffering is redemptive and has a purpose. And, uh, and that's what lament is. Lament is just the language of, of all that. It's David and Job and who, who, anyone else you want to name um, offering up their suffering. Okay. Mark, I think it's interesting that this is persecuted church. Who's Mark? I mean, hmm. Yeah. Well, I, again, when we used to go to China, um, and this was when it, it was, they were, they were putting people in jail, and I mean, it was pretty bad. And we would go, I remember one time we were, there was a church we were going to meet with, and we were 24 hours late getting there. There had been a typhoon, and the plane was, we had to take another plane, and the you know, there was a problem with everything. It was a nightmare, okay? They waited for us. There are a couple of hundred people in a garage. And guess what? They were overjoyed. I'd never seen anything like it. Yeah, if, if, if you made me wait for 24 hours when you got there, I would not be overjoyed, okay? But they had this sense of joy. I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, I've got a video of it I can show you. It's pretty cool. They're singing these songs. I have no idea what they're singing, but I, I, they're awfully joyful. And they didn't know who we were. They just knew that we were Christians who come from America who wanted to greet them, you know, here, bring greetings from and bring some Bibles with us. So I don't know. But I think that that kind of joy you see in, in the persecuted church. And, and one, one thing you said, I, 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 I did say, and yes, but, um, you know, the idea that, oh, we don't suffer much here. Um, this comes from a pastor in China. Uh, I was talking to um, talking to him and kind of fawning again. He had been he'd been in prison for 22 years uh, for being a Christian and constantly beat. Uh, they used to leave him out in the snow. They called him snowman because they, they were they hoped he would die of hypothermia and he never did. Um, but so I'm like, oh, I'm not, I've got a picture of my Bible. Um, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Right. And he said, uh, he said, no, you in America, you have your own your own uh, experience of suffering. Here he is. Um, but he said, but it puts you to sleep. But he, he acknowledged that we, we suffered as well. Look at that face. It's just a beautiful face. Yeah. 22 years in prison. And he could have said, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. And they would let him go. What yeah. did he mean when he said it, it puts you to sleep? Um, well, it kind of relates to what he said. He goes, well, we really don't suffer. And I think he was, what he meant was, no, you really do suffer, but you're just unaware of it. There, you know, again, the, the suicide rate's really high, isn't it, in America? So there's suffering all around us and confusion. We, we uh, distract ourselves probably better. I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but. I have a, a quick question. Sure. I'll wait for Rachel. There's been kind of a revival of a contemporary rev revival of stoicism. There's kind of a trend. There's a couple best-selling books Ooh. out recently. Um, and I, I've kind of observed that with just sort of some detached interest because it, it feels like it's sort of the atheist way of trying to make sense of, of suffering in the world. Hmm. Um, and, and, and to sort of, you know, not look away from it or distract oneself from it, which... Is a, is a step, but but do you have a, a way of sort of explaining what's different about lament from stoicism? Okay. You know what what would be we might say is the counterfeit of stoicism. What's what's the true stoicism is counterfeit? That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. what's the, what's the true thing? What's the difference? Okay, when I first started in this, and this again, this was 20 years ago, I was at Columbia Bible College, and I was 
again, I, you know, I had no idea what I was talking about. Just spouting off from some notes, you know, like I do every day, every night. And I was saying, my criticism then was that the church doesn't know how to lament. And I said, I said, the world doesn't know how to lament. There's no lamenting going on. And one of the students held up his hand. He said, have you ever listened to Counting Crows? <laughs> because his point was, no, the world understands lament. Because this isn't, you know, just an exclusively Christian phenomenon. I mean, the, the creation's lamenting. The earth is groaning in, in, in Paul's terms. But I, I do think we uniquely with this connection to God and the, and the, the meaning, we, it becomes meaningful. You know, uh, he's not going to always take it away, but he's always going to use it. I think I grew up with the idea and a lot of American Christians have the idea that God's purpose, he's the m M&M man. We're down here in the map, right? We haven't gone through the wilderness to real presence where the most important thing is being with him and not having things fixed. So I grew up with the idea that God is the eminent man. He's going to fix it. If you have enough faith, he's going to fix it. But then you, you see somebody lose a couple of children in 13 months and you go, there's a real problem here. Houston, we have a problem. The answer is not as simple as I thought it was. But the point to you, back to your question is, I think we uniquely have, I don't want to say the answer, but something like the word answer. We have meaning. You know, someone who's suffering and weeping, it's not just my job to fix them. I can hopefully help them understand because they're, they might be suffering for any number of reasons, but what? Huh? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll talk about it, Kev. Well, you know, and, and let me say this, a, a lot that I learned about lament, I learned from uh, the black church, from spirituals, right? There's this honest lifting up, you know, of your suffering to God. And, and you ask yourselves, you know, the, the slaves who were bought, brought here, um, why, how is it that they embrace Christianity, that they embrace the faith of the people that were persecuting them? I think it's because... They, they learn about Christ and it made all their sufferings have meaningful, have meaning. Yeah. And they were worshiping and understanding who Christ was in ways that their, you know, Christian masters were clueless. I mean, how about that? I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, yes. I'm just thinking about some of the books like in, in Hebrews or Romans or other places where we are encouraged or let me just put it in my own thinking. This might not be what the word is saying, but just encouraged to sort of um, remember who God is, remember what he's done, you know, kind of grow up here. Um, Formula of remembrance. <laughs> yeah. So I think, am I right in hearing that, that some of, being able to recognize that only comes once you first acknowledge that um, you are broken by this suffering or what, whatever you're experiencing. Can I truly move into a more mature place about God and who he is um, if everything's okay? Yeah. Well, I'll say yes, but with a quali- well, I'll qualify that. I don't ever want to leave the impression that it's all about us figuring out how to do this the right way. Because I think regardless of ourselves and our confusion, God in his grace, his mercy will bring us to this place, you know, um, without having to, you know, figure it out. It's, it's really not so much about figuring it out. I guess it's kind of more about letting go or something like that. But fundamentally, yes, what you said, yeah, you, you have to come to this point. I, I just feel like there's such, uh, going back to what Mark was saying, there's such a fundamental difference between us and the persecuted church. Um, and I don't know if that's coming from not having or, or not experiencing suffering in a way that brings us real revelation about who God is. Yeah. Well, was it was it Sultanisen or Bonhoeffer? Sultanisen said, "Thank you, prison." 
because he would have never understood God the way he did. I think it was Solzhenitsyn that said that. But Bonhoeffer says the same thing. Bonhoeffer is thanking God for his suffering. And on our side, we go, I, I don't get thanking God for suffering? I don't think so, right? But uh, maybe that's a perspective you only have. Maybe that's what you're saying. You only have that perspective. after. But at the same time, I, I don't want to think we can't experience uh, this idea of even if our suffering isn't as great. I mean, I've never, well, I was in prison once for being a Christian for about eight hours. And I displayed a little less than Pauline courage. I was, <laughs> I was lamenting, but it wasn't, it wasn't biblical lament. It was uh, a different kind of lament. But, um, but because we, I, I don't want to think because we, we, we're not being beaten and thrown in jail that we can't still experience this. But, and but, but, you know, yeah. One of the first things you said tonight, I didn't understand. It was um, lament leads us to understand the life of Jesus. Yes. And I thought, where is he going with this? Yeah. But then as I'm listening, I'm realizing that I grew up in a certain situation where we never felt we deserved to lament. Hmm. You know, just um, with ever suffering that we had, very strong family background mm -hmm. and you know, kind of, you know, shape up to get through it. Yeah. And just what That's I'm shushing. hearing. That's the yeah. shushing I was talking about. So I'm like, what is going to happen in, the, in our study with you? Because this is interesting about being able to lament and becoming closer to the Lord, seeing his life like that. You know, and I've been a Christian for years, and this was the first time I'm hearing this mm -hmm. in a Bible study. And I was wondering if others can identify I had never heard about it, but then I went and read Brueggemann, and he's, he talks about it. There, there are people, they're not the best-selling books, but uh, Walter Brueggemann, for me, was one of the, the, the door, people that opened the door into this. Uh, I can't rem he's written several books. I can't remember. Uh, but they're, they're, I'm, I mean, I've written 27 books. My favorite book of the ones I've written is called A Sacred Sorrow. It's on this. So this is one of my favorite topics. Which is kind of odd, isn't it? <laughs> Suffering and lament. It's my favorite topic. No. But, but again, if, if you have had that confusion your whole life, it, it really is, it was uh, um, liberating. It's liberating. I know what, I know what, that I know that I can, that God wants my tears. That he wants my confusion. I've got something to do with it now other than pretending like I'm okay. I'm not okay. Y'all, I'm so messed up. You have, if you knew how messed up I was, you'd all run from this place screaming, right? And you certainly wouldn't listen to what I have to say. But the truth is, God uses our confusion and all those things. Yeah. Michael, I'll try to keep it brief, and that's not easy for me. But um, a, a couple of things I would like to briefly explore. Um, I wonder if it, somehow there might be some sort of tie-in here with the idea of um, looking into your generational influences. I almost want to say generational curses. My, my family, particularly the men coming up, were hard men. These were men who fought war with knives, mm -hmm. up close and personal. Kill people with their bare hands. Yes, and then mm -hmm. go be normal and happy. Yes. Yeah, so th the way they dealt with it was just they were men of iron, um, even including a brother living today who did things you don't want to know about um, with in, in Vietnam. But, um, I mean, I wonder if there's, some, if there's some benefit in looking back and trying to understand those stories and heal the frozenness. I can say from my own line, not just the men, we do not... Weep, we do not exalt. It's like everything is uh, mezzo, mezzo piano moderato. Mm. Well, um, take it from the guy who was on his hands and knees howling like a dog for an hour. Yeah. It's in there. Yeah, that's, thank you. Um, and another thing, and I'll, uh, is there, um, I, I'm wondering if perhaps it might be worthwhile to look more deeply into other cultural traditions that deal with this better. I'm thinking of Judaism, at least more openly. Uh, Gustav Mahler, Kinden Totenlieder, 
if you're if you're writing a song cycle orchestrated about the deaths of children, you're at least not stuffing your emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, Kinder Tone later. And for that matter, even now in contemporary performance practice, listen to Itzhak Perlman play Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. You know, I, well, I weep every time I hear that. Well, and I think Judaism is the place to look for, and there there are a number of good books. One of the best ones is called The Mourner's Way, mm -hmm. and it, she's the I forget the ladies. It was written by a woman, but it's a it's basically unpacking mourning practices in Judaism from you know ancient times. Yeah. And uh, Mourner's Way is a was a, a path in the temple that was drawn in the floor, mm -hmm. and if you were mourning. You walk in the temple, you walk that way, and no one talked to you. People leave you alone when you're mourning in Judaism. People don't come up and say, oh, it's going to be fine. It's all for the better. They don't do that. And there's a pres prescribed period of time when no one talks to you. And if someone's died, there's a prescribed period of time where you don't mention their name. Mm. It's really interesting. Really, Yeah, the mourner's way. I can't remember her name. It's Thank been. You. Yeah, I've got all this in my bibliography. I'll bring one of those books next week and I've, I'll have my bibliography. Yeah, I think we're going to enter a chapter, uh, Michael, where we, um, you know, really see a restorative of some of our, you know, mental health and, you know, and our Absolutely. hurt hearts and the things that we've buried. And I mean, week to week, I'm sure the Holy Spirit's going to be, you know, wooing us and bringing this to the forefront. So, you know, what a privilege it is. And on, on the, to start this on Veterans Day as well, isn't it, today? Mm. And Remembrance Sunday. So, you know, are there any other questions um, before I'm going to ask Mike to close us out in prayer and maybe think about the Veterans Day today if yeah. that's, if, and okay. honouring them? Okay, let me pray. Yeah. Uh, Father, uh, we come to you as your children. And we, we look to your word and we ask that you would make us wise, that, that the wisdom of your word would become part of the way we see the world and our instinct and the way we treat each other and, and the way we even treat ourselves. We're mindful today of um, the men and women who've, who've given their lives uh, so that people they don't even know can be free. It's a very Christ-like thing, and we, we, uh, we honor them uh, before you, Father. And we, we ask for blessing for them, for those that are uh, suffering and confused and, and um, don't, don't know what to do with this, the, the sorrow and the pain that they brought back. Uh, we ask that some, some of the ideas that we're sharing would be actualized somehow by your Spirit in their lives. Um, and we thank you that we're free. We can get together like this and talk about you as long as we want to, any place we want to. And we're, we're mindful of that and thankful for that, too. So there's nothing but thanksgiving in our hearts right now as we leave this place. And most of all, Lord Jesus, we're thankful for you for weeping our tears and entering into our suffering and giving it meaning and purpose. And we pray that you'd help us to understand uh, this in the coming weeks. And we ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, just one. Um...